PR Stop Peru Stop COVID, featuring Michael Schoenfeld, Vice President for Public Affairs and Government Relations and Chief Communications Officer at Duke University. Here's our host, Doug Simon. Mike, thanks for being here with us. And Duke had an advantage when it came to understanding the dangers of COVID because you have a joint partnership with the university in China. Can you jump right into it there? Uh, yes, thanks, Doug, and great to be here with you. Uh, we do have a university outside of Shanghai in Kunshan, China. It's about 40 miles uh, outside of Shanghai that has been developed over the last 10 years or so. And one of the advantages that we, one of the small advantages that we had uh, in, the, in the pandemic was that we had received, um, started getting advance notice essentially from our uh, team in China going back to late December, that there was a, an outbreak of a mysterious illness in Wuhan. The reason this was notable for us is because our partner in this venture is Wuhan University. So I've been to Wuhan a number of times. We have many colleague, colleagues and teammates there. Had it happened in any other Chinese city, we might have been a little bit less vigilant about it, but because it was happening in Wuhan, we paid close attention and then went through the whole cycle, the whole process that, that we ultimately went through here in the US in March and April, um, but we did that in January and February in China. So uh, evacuating the campus, uh, transitioning to remote learning, uh, dealing with um, major national health crisis issues. So we, we, did, we did have a bit of an early warning. We were able to get our uh, systems and processes in place um, the other, other part of that, of course, it means that we have been meeting every day and dealing with this issue every day since middle, uh, the, the middle of December. Yeah. So let's jump now to closer to this semester starting. How did you go about putting your plan together for that, as well as communicating what that plan was going to be, especially with so much uncertainty? Well, it, it's a great question, and the uh, underscore where there is uncertainty. So things that we knew in January, uh, we, we, we would say that, that uh, as we were going through January, February, March, something that was inconceivable at breakfast became <laughs> um, almost possible at lunch and by dinner was already done. And we repeated that cycle every single day for, uh, for a period of time. Uh, once we sort of went through that, that acute phase, we went through the, we had the heart attack, if you will, um, we then went into a form of rehab. And that form of rehab, which we're all still going through right now, obviously, that form of rehab was planning for and pre trying to predict a future that nobody could plan for and that nobody could predict for. So if you think about, if you think about it that way, in March, April, May, June, we were trying to predict what was going to happen in September. Nobody could predict what was going to happen in September. But so nonetheless, we actually put in place um, things like testing regimens, uh, de-densifying the campus, planning for both a, a combination of remote and, and in-person education. But I think most important, what we were trying to, and we were communicating all of this to our many different stakeholders, students, faculty, staff, um, alumni, donors, sports fans, patients, because we, run a, a, we, we have always run a major academic medical center throughout all of this. Uh, communi we communicated the details repeatedly, frequently, uh, using both new channels like video, but very old school. Email was the most important and the most, if people didn't get an email from us about whatever it was, they didn't believe it. If they didn't hear from us directly about it, they didn't believe mm -hmm. it. Even if they heard it from other places and in other sources, they wanted to hear it directly from the university. So in addition to the content, Probably the thing that we can try to convey most frequently, most um, uh, emphatically was the need for flexibility and the need for resilience. This was go oh, it, where we are today uh, doesn't look anything like what we expected it was going to look mm -hmm. like in March, April and May. And without that flexibility, we would have a very, very brittle environment. And, 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 that, and that's something that, that really is part of the education process whether for us or, or, or any other employer, flexibility has been absolutely critical in all of this. 
And if you can give us a quick top line of where you are today, which is in mid September, obviously things can change. You know, we hear different state colleges having major challenges. How are things going and what were the keys to get you to the point where you are today? We decided to de-densify the campus. That's everybody's new favorite word. We Mm de-densified the campus uh, so that we have now about half the number of people living here. Uh, We also have a number of students living off campus in the community. About two thirds of our classes are online only. Uh, there are about a third of our classes that are in person or hybrid. That is, there are. And enjoy- you gave the professors the option of teaching in person or going fully online. Yes, we gave every faculty member in all of our schools uh, the, uh, the, com- the complete option. They did not have to apply for an exemption, they did not have to apply for an accommodation. If they wanted to teach online, they could. If they wanted to teach in person, they could. Uh, we also developed a very comprehensive and still changing testing regimen. Testing and contact tracing obviously identified as two of the critical things. Uh, you can't do enough testing um, in the environment that we have. So we tested, uh, we, we urged students to get tested before they came to campus. We tested every student when they came to campus. And we have a surveillance testing program that will uh, test every student. Uh, and many faculty and staff who are on campus, uh, probably an average of once a week, although um, for some it will be greater. Uh, We've also, for most of our, we have 43,000 employees. So 20,000 or uh, 25,000 or so are in our health system. So they're working all the way through. The remainder of our staff, unless they are, unless you have a direct on-campus need, you're involved in utilities or you're involved in security or you're involved in IT or other things that have to be on campus or you're working with students, um, we have a good you know, two thirds of our non-healthcare uh, workforce, more than that actually, three quarters probably, is working from home uh, every day and have not yeah. been on campus since March. And that's been working well for you. Now, Duke obviously is in somewhat of a unique position as a top private institution with its own medical center that it's affiliated with. What are lessons learned, things that could possibly be applied for schools that may not have your resources, simply put, whether it's a state university or other school? Well, it's it, it, that too is a great question. There are fi- almost 5,000 colleges in America. If you've seen one college, you've seen one college. Uh, mm-hmm. Every place has its own unique environment. Every place has its own um, constituency. Every place has its culture. Every place has a different kind of community where uh, it's engaged in. Every place has a different um, political and governance structure. So if you look at, for instance, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, one of the great public universities in the country, eight miles down the road, um, did things very, very differently than, than, than we did. They um, invited back all the students, they filled all the dorms, they did no testing. And there were a number of reasons uh, um, behind that. Uh, and very quickly, the, um, the environment there collapsed and, and unfortunately they had to, to um, send all of their students home and go uh, completely remote. So uh, th- there are a lot of different factors that, that come into play here. Um, clearly testing is, uh, and the ability to do testing, to do contact tracing, and to do that on a consistent basis is helpful. Having a medical center, as you point out, and having the tremendous world-class expertise here, but also available for those universities that don't have medical centers. There are a lot of them around that, that are interested in and willing to, um, to assist. And then I think there's, a, there's an atmospheric and, and cultural aspect. We, and again, our, everybody's students are different. Um, it has become very uh, vogue to um, essentially beat up on your students. Uh, Mm -hmm. and tell them that they are the only thing standing between life and death, success and failure. Um, We didn't (laughs) take that approach uh, and and, and that worked. We worked very closely in partnership with our students. Uh, uh, Our our students were were part of the planning process uh, and and part of the the you know, part of the whole um, effort. We, we, uh, our return to campus campaign was called Duke United. And if you go online and if you, if you go around the campus, if you look at the signage, if you look at the information, everything is around Duke United. We were united around this. And so far that has worked, not without, uh, you know, look, every place has knuckleheads and we have our knuckleheads too. 
but um, but not in the in the way that has endangered the the integrity and the um, and the ability of the university to function, and that's why this week we have a grand total of six active cases among our students, and that's been about what we've had for the last four weeks. Yeah. So um, I, 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 the last thing I'll say is never underestimate the value of luck. We are mm -hmm. we have did a lot of planning. But we're all, we've also been incredibly lucky. And for college basketball fans out there, uh, this is for, for us, this is a bit like a tournament. You survive in advance. And mm -hmm. we survived in advance to today and we'll survive in advance to tomorrow. Yeah, and I think the lesson, the takeaway for others watching is one is you need to have a clear communications plan about what you do that engages the students, the parents, the key constituencies. And for those that don't necessarily have a, those resources, Part of that communication has to be how you can get the necessary resources to do what can be to limit the potential damage and challenges that COVID faces, which are enormous. And I would say as part of that, an important part of that communication strategy is repetition. We have a large organization. We have to repeat things many, many times, but that goes to place that, that, that applies as well for, for small in, uh, institutions. Um, uh, speed um, when in, in a world in which people's uh, in which information, uh, particularly information about colleges, which are in, really mm -hmm. in the spotlight right now, uh, gets magnified and multiplied. You have to be out there quickly with your constituents. Um, third, internal communications is absolutely vital. Um, uh, we, we have an environment, and I'm sure this is the case with many universities, uh, they may see it on TV, they may see it on the internet somewhere, they may see it at a news source, they may hear it in, from, from a neighbor, but until they hear it from us directly, um, it, it doesn't, it almost doesn't sink in. So we have to communicate right. directly with people. Yeah, and that's a model that works for corporations. Communicating internally is growing more important. Thanks so much for spending time with us. You're welcome. Look forward to um, seeing what happens in a month or two or three.